<laughs> Hello, everybody. Hi. Where go? Hello. Gracias. Um, estoy seco, sorry. Es, uh, I'm... Estoy celoso. <laughs> Bueno, eh, bienvenido, Denis. Well, eh, thank you for having me. Gracias por venir. Thank you. Sabemos que hablo, hablo español. Bueno, hola a todos. Buenas tardes, buenas noches. Algunas caras familiares conocidas, eh, otros nuevos. Eh, Denis, hablo en castellano porque Denis habla español también. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I, I don't know anything. Eh, todos hablan español. Sí, por aquí, todos hablan castellano. Necesitamos hablar en inglés, por alguno en especial. No, está bien. You're going to hear Spanglish today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Actually, before it was, it was like this. <laughs> exactly. In the taxi. I'm yeah. completely a professional at Spanglish. And, and why, but why you, you speak so well Spanish? Uh, well, I'm from New York, and uh, I'm half Puerto Rican and half Bermudan. Yeah. So my mother decided not to speak English to me. <laughs> and she's from Puerto Rico. She's from Puerto Rico, yes. And Bermuda. And Bermuda is my father's side. Okay, yeah. but you born in, in. I was born in New York. Yeah. New York. Mm -hmm. um, and then, at 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 what moment uh, the music come into your life in New York? Uh, everybody likes to ask me that question, but it's um, it's weird because it's always it was always there. Uh, at I, home or no, it was just it was just there it was just I always remember it I'm sorry I always remember it since I was a child um, like when I was a, when I was a small child I maybe como tres años cuatro años me compraron eso eso piano chiquito para para ni niños sí, y yo tocándolo como como <laughs> like that all day driving uh -huh. my driving her crazy 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 y si no era con lo, los los artenes también You know, so you know you when you hang up your clothes, uh -huh. you know, you know lo, lo, the wood pins, the the the, the madera, the pins. Sí. Yo era chiquito cogiendo los pins con la sartén. <laughs> Ella, Danny. <laughs> I was like, ring, 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 ring. So, I always, it, sometimes it's just there. Uh -huh. That's the best way I I can put it. But at, at, in algún momento de tu vida. ¿Hiciste algo, com comenzaste como DJ o productor primero? Uh, I was always first a songwriter, producer. Um, because I grew, I'm, I'm going to show my age. I'm so sorry, everybody. Estoy un poquito viejito aquí. No, you have to be proud of this. <laughs> Many people would like to be like you at your age. I I'm going to be the cool grandpa here today. Um, I grew up in the 70s. And it was a lot of disco, a lot of, I was there when hip hop first started. And um, literally that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to make records, you know? So my thing was always, hey, I want to make what I just heard. Yeah. You know, I would walk by the music store on my way from school with, with the backpack. And then, and, and then I'd hear like earth, wind and fire. And I'm like, what's that? And so I would go and I'd be like, I want to make records like that. Yeah, but in, in that moment, the the ways how to listen to music wasn't like a no. do, doing swipe um, in your phone. No, you have, you walked by the record store with your back. You're leaving school, right? You're like, doo, 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 doo. and then you'd hear the wicker rap is what it is, and you're like, the music coming from the record yeah, from, store. Yeah, from the record store. Yeah, yeah. Y, y para uno, with all your friends, like, yo, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let's go inside. And they'd be like, oh, again? I'd be like, yeah, let's go inside again. You were just there yesterday, bro. No, I want to go back. Y ahí con los tres pesos, right? The three dollars from lunch. Buy some records. Yeah, buy a record. Oh. Yeah, but then in your environment with your friends, oh, going out from the school after school, passing by the record shop, there are some friends that near to you that maybe with some of them you say, okay, let's do that. Or, or it was a solo well, adventure. Uh, At first it was solo, but you know, when you're young, you know, you're 12 years old, 11 years old, 13 years old, you know, you have your friends, you got your crew, you got your little crew in New York, right? That yeah. you'll hang out with. And so at that point, it's like everybody was listening to all different kinds of music, different kinds of records, and you all get together. And then half of the time it was on our radios, 
you know. So we would, in New York, when I was younger, we would all hang out in the street, right? And hang out, it'd be como 20 nosotros ahí, hangueando en un mailbox, right? Just a mailbox like this. Haciendo nada todo el día, like, you know? And so somebody would come out with a, with a, with a radio, and they would be like, yo, mixtape. And it'd be all different kinds of music. And we'd just be like, yeah, the whole block. Yo lo que hacía de pequeño grababa de la radio, por ejemplo. The radio, the radio was really good at that time too. Music was much, much different at that point. Uh, it's not like today. You would hear all the hits, like all your favorite records, like right there on the radio. On like the radio. From, like when you got out of school at 3 p.m., at 3 p.m., it'd be like Ralph McDaniels and Video Music Box. But then like the radio station knew all the kids were getting out of school at 3 p.m. And so they rock all the jams. All the jams, and you'd like 3 p.m., bro. School, hit the radio outside. Oh, that's my joy. Oh, and everybody's going nuts. New York was was amazing. And there wasn't time. wasn't too much uh, studios in in New York at oh, that no, time. Oh no, there was tons of studios. Tons of studios. Tons of studios. Uh, New York was amazing for studios at that time. Uh, man, there was so many, so many. Even until uh, the 90s, till the late 90s, there were. I mean, it was big. Studio Town. New York City was huge. From Unique to, uh, oh, there was so many. The Hit Factory, Sony. There was so many, so many amazing studios. A lot of, I mean, I did a lot of work in, in, in them. And then you started to, to, to play with different styles at the same time. Not only hip hop, you've been there. Actually, yeah. it was one person that you've been in. I, I, I wrote some interview that uh -huh. the right person in the right time, in the right moment, with different styles, Afro. <laughs> Gospel, yes. different moments on the electronic music story. It was an amazing time because at one point you can hear Sergio Mendez, and another point you could hear Earth, Wind, and Fire, and Stephanie Mills, and another point you could hear like Curtis Blow, Grandmaster Flash, and the Furious Five. It, it, all this music was like a melting pot, like New York at that time. At that time. So the radio stations reflected that. It's a lot more difficult nowadays to, to find that kind of music. You have to be more proactive in searching and opening up your, your, your mind to new music now. Whereas before, the program directors would say, hey, let's put this kind of music on for everybody, blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? Now you've got to get curated playlists, and you're looking for people who are kind of interesting in their choices of music. So in a way, it's changed, but in a way, it's kind of cooler now, too, you know? And then at some point you turned from producer into DJ. Uh, how how it happened? <laughs> that's a that's a difficult question. <laughs> no, no, but no, because for example, uh, I'm I'm talking about my case. Okay, yeah. um, I I was playing music at home with the computer, creating music at home, and then I met a friend that he was DJ, mm -hmm. and he teach me. To, to play records and they teach him how to create music, you know? And okay. from that point, it started in, in my case, for example. Well, in my case, uh, my first album was, was when I was 18 years old. Uh, that's when I did my first album. And that was on Beachwood Music, EMI, out of the UK. And I started, I mean, I did a lot of records before I did DJ. Um, I was in techno for a very long time, like, Like real techno, <laughs> but with like, different uh, AKs, <laughs> nah. different names under different uh, names. I started Sinewave Records with Damon Wild. Um, Damon, it was Damon's label at the time, but I was the, I was part of it. Let's just say, um, and I did, uh, yeah, did techno as Morph as. Orosphere. I wrote this, yeah. Uh, yeah, I did a lot of techno back then, and then I worked with Tetsuo Inoue doing ambient techno. Uh, who worked with Peter Namluk, mm -hmm. and so he was a mentor of mine when I was very young too. Uh, so for many, many years, I think maybe 15 years of my early career, I was just a producer, songwriter. And then um, I met Kerry Chandler. And uh, Kerry... He, he's from New York as well. Well, he's from Jersey. Jersey. And uh, when ne I was neighbor, younger... Same neighborhood or...? Yeah, he lived down the block from me. But I didn't, I didn't know who Kerry Chandler was. And I, I worked in a music store at the time because uh, it was a different point in my life where I thought I didn't want to do music anymore. I was kind of tired. I was done. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to school uh, to be a, uh, a coder. 
So I, you know, I went to school for C++, C++ Visual Basic, SQL Server, blah, 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 yeah, coding things. And um, I worked in a music store part-time, Rogue Music in New York, and Kerry came in and he was asking for some equipment. And I was like, you don't want that, you want this. You know, trying to sell the most expensive piece of equipment I can. <laughs> and uh, we became friends. And I realized he lived down the block from me, like literally down the block. So, but I still didn't know who Kerry Chandler was. This is the truth, the absolute truth. But on that time, uh, Kerry Chandler was Kerry Chandler already? Yeah, he was, I didn't know that. He was already Kerry Chandler, but I didn't, I didn't care. I'm, yeah. I'm just like, hey, this is this guy who, who does music, who lives close to me, right? So he says, hey, you know, hit me up. And I'm like, I knock on his door all hours in the night, you know, hey, Kerry, can I come in? And he's got this amazing studio. I'm like, okay, it's a nice place. All right, I don't know. Whatever, you know. Did you have your own studio at that moment? I used to, but I sold everything. Ah, because you, you I quit. Some, yeah. Yes. So he's like, yeah, you know, just hang out here. So one day he says, hey, come with me to Boston to a gig. I'm like, a gig? What are you doing? Playing live? Because we used to play live. I used to play live. On that time? Yeah. In techno in those days, you played live. You didn't, you know, I mean, you DJed, but you played live. So I go up to Boston with him. And he's playing, and I hear, Kara, 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 the hands in the air. I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> like, who's, like, who, who? It's like, you know, a stranger, and all of a sudden you're like, who the fuck was I hanging out all this time with? That's, that to me was Carrie. And like, oh shit, okay, I guess he must be somebody. I don't know, to me, he's just a dude who lives next door. So anyway, he played this record by Kenny Bobium. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was called the, it's called Why We Sing. It was, a, it was Kenny Bobian's remake of Donnie McClurkin, Why We Sing. And I'm telling you right now, when that record came on, everybody started singing it. You're the reason why we sing. And I'm like, holy shit, this is amazing. Y se me salieron las lágrimas. Like this, like, oh my God, that's the reason why I sing. <laughs> So I'm singing the song too, right? And so I go home and I'm like, yo, Kerry, what was that record? And he gave me the record. And from that day on is when I got back into music. I said, I want to make records again. Because if that record can make me feel a certain way, then this is what I want to do to everybody else. I want you to feel an emotion when you hear my record. The same way that record spoke to me that day and changed my, because that record changed my life. Kerry changed my life because I was wasting away. I, I'd given everything up. I said, ah, you know, like whatever. And so then I started bothering poor Kerry. <laughs> I would be there every day, every night. That poor man, I, oh, God bless him, poor, poor dude. And we would have DJ battles. DJ battles. Look, I, I don't, I can't freaking DJ, but here's Kerry Chandler trying to teach me how to DJ. And every night just battling. And he would put his friends up against me. Like Irby, she could, I mean, she could play her ass off. She would kick my ass every night. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, uh, uh, uh. and this was on decks. Yeah. This was on. This was on like vinyl with all decks, not with, with the gold turn the, the gold S, uh, SL two hundreds, the gold ones. Where if you move it just a little bit, yeah, yeah, good luck. That whole mix falls apart on you. So every night, and that's that's how I got into DJing really, and um, and that became my my second lease on life. And then uh, this through carry you came into defected, uh, street no. rhythms? Uh, this is a very long story, guys. <laughs> um, okay, so through Kerry, though, I did meet a lot of talented individuals. Um, what, what, it, music business is really funny, you know, because they don't teach you everything. You know, you think you, you, think you know everything. You know, you make a few records, because you think you're cool, right? You made all these, you don't know shit. 
You don't know nothing. The only thing you learn is, the only thing that can teach you is time. Experiences where you learn everything and meeting, and, and this is a great place. Take advantage of it because everybody in here has something to offer you. Because when I was younger, I wouldn't have thought that, right? I say that because in Carrie's house, all of these musicians would come and all these people who can play. We had the whole Blue Note roster. Everybody on Blue Note records. I mean, if you know Blue Note, these are like the most craziest players you can ever have. And Jerome Sinem shows up. And Jerome was the one I did sandcastles with. He's the one who taught me arrangement. Like real arrangement. I thought I knew arrangement. I didn't know shit about arrangement until Jerome came into my life. So at certain points, these people are going to pop into your life. And you have to know what they're good at. And you learn from them. You, you, you just you soak it up because you're going to need it. Because once you think you know everything, mm, that's the end of your trip. That's the end of your trip. So in Carrie's house, I learned arrangement from Jerome Sinem. He's a master arranger. Is a UNC. I'd look at him and I'm like, you serious? Bro? And at the same time, you had all those musicians oh with very talented, but you learned Jerome so. was the guy in arrangement. Because arrangement is everything for your record. Arrangement is everything. You could write the most amazing piece of music ever. The, you think you got a great hook. You think you got the, 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 the most important part of the record, which is the goob. We call the goob the melody, the main melody that attracts you. Okay? That's, we, we call that the goob. That's an old saying. If you've got the goob, which is the main melody in your record, and connects it, and you've got, let's say, a chorus that's very catchy, you think you got a record, right? Mm -mm. No, because the arrangement has to be properly leading up to that. If you mess that up, if you mess up the timing on that record leading up to that, se te cae todo. Se te cae todo. You're just looking at it like, it's like jello. You're like, the idea was, how many records have you heard like that? You, know, you play the first 30 seconds and you go, that's cool. And then you go, oh, why do you do that for? <laughs> Botalo. Yeah. So arrangement is everything. Everything. And once he taught me that, once I, once I learned that from Jerome, my records changed instantly. Instantly. They, they, they became something else. You can hear it. If you listen to my catalog, you can hear where all of a sudden it changed. Like, I got it. And that's, 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 that's very important. Um, and this music in, in New York was this scene What kind of clubs do you have on that time, like Little Louis Vuitton, um, Master of Works? All those guys were near to you at the same time, or? There was so many things going on in New York at the time. Uh, of course, you had Little Louis when he played at Devil's Nest, but that's when I was very young. Uh, you had the Tunnel. Uh, you had definitely had Limelight. Limelight was more techno-oriented. Um, I used to I played there a few times. Uh, the bank, which was a small, the, the, the world, which was on Lower East Side. There were so many clubs, so many, excuse me, so many artists. It was, you never knew who was in town that night. It was crazy. It was just so much, it was so much music happening. You know, and, you could, and you'd be able to get any kind of music. You could go to the club at night, right? And that morning, go to Dan Soteria and buy the records you heard that night. Just be like, yeah, I want, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, boom, boom, and go home. And maybe the, the person that is in the record shop, he was at that, that Charlie, night. Charlie, Charlie knew everything. Charlie, who owned Dance Inter uh, a Dance, um, God, God, not Dance Inter Dance Mania. I can't, just, I can't remember the name of this record shop. Jeez, sorry, Charlie, you're going to kill me. <laughs> Doesn't oh matter, it's fine. Yeah. It's Charlie, this one, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Who wants this record? <laughs> <laughs> and um, Chicago. Um, it was in, in parallel at the same time, growing up, two scenes. Nah, we, we, for the most part, we, it was two different worlds. Yeah, because many people, it's like, okay, Kerry Chandler, Chicago House? Mm -hmm. No. No, but two different worlds. You know because you are from there, but in the world, you are New York, Chicago, Garage, Chicago House, whatever, right? Yeah. But from outside, it's... 
Many people think that it's kind no, of the same. It, it was it was completely separate. We, we everybody had their scenes. You know, L.A. had their scenes with Doc Martin. You know, Chicago had their scene. You know, everybody did. D.C. had their scenes. Florida was completely different. Miami was different than us. Everybody had their scenes, but. You know, when when you're young and you're in this in this music, you're focused mainly in your area. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot different now. A lot different now. Now with the advent of everything, now you're paying attention everywhere. It happened with the Martinez brothers as well. And the, when they started, they have to try with their fathers, keeping near in the club mm -hmm. scene. Mm -hmm. You have a, they play. They re release some records in Objectivity, yes. and uh, it was a kind of platform for them to. When they started, yes, yes. There, there, there was a, that's all I did was I wanted to give them a platform for them to kind of get their thing going, you know? Objectivity is already yeah, from 2006, something like this? I think it's 2006, yeah. It's been, it's been around a while. <laughs> And it's still rocking. Still rocking. And uh, for you, it's a platform from new artists or you choose? I, I have a weird way of looking at things. Um, I use the label, you have to be careful how I say this. Um, We can cut anyway. <laughs> after. I use, I started a label because I didn't want anybody to tell me how to, how to, how to make a record. That's it. I, now that's not to say that I wanted to put out all my stuff on my label. I didn't think I was that amazing. I just wanted an outlet to say, okay, you know what? Here's 20 records I've made. Five of them I know a company will take. But these other 10 are really weird, but I like them. But they're weird. They're, they're, they're fucking weird, okay? I don't know if anybody's gonna like them, but I feel like I should put them out. And you never know, because with records, you throw them against the wall. Re records are like that. You throw them against the wall and you hope they stick. So objectivity became a, a, an outlet for me where I said, okay, I want to try something different. I want to try adding a vocal with a little bit more like a techno y kind of thing, but it's still soulful, right? And that was taking a chance at that time because it was very soulful at those days. So I said, okay, but you know, let's have a little bit of a more happy chorus. Like, And I heard you say, hey, hey. Okay, that's kind of cool, right? But if I put that out anywhere else, I think people are going to be like, that's fucking nuts. But you know what? I'll put it out on objectivity. So I put it out on objectivity, and it stuck, and it became hey, hey. You see? And that wouldn't have been hey, hey if I would have put it somewhere else, because somebody would have said, that's too crazy. It's never going to work. But as soon as I put it out on objectivity, the numbers start going up. Mm -hmm. So I took that chance. So sometimes when you own a label, it's not to put out everything you do, because not everything you do is going to be good. And that's, I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make. You shouldn't put out everything you make. That's dumb. That's just fucking dumb. I'm sorry. You got a whole folder of records, 50 records. Judge them. Take the best five. Put them out. The other shit, nobody's ever going to hear again. I got, a, I got a hard drive full of 200 songs that are fucking crazy. That if you heard them, you'd be like, oh, hell no. <laughs> Just because you make them doesn't mean they should come out. And I think that's what's going on a lot nowadays. So when you have a label, let me turn back this way. So when you have a label, all right, maybe those songs that you have that you thought, eh, that's, what the, that's when you put out a label. Unless you have a label to make money. But to me, it was never about the money. It's, it's never really been about the money. But then a lot of I, a lot of artists release on your label, and this is a question that, uh, as a label owner, mm -hmm. is, uh, maybe there, I don't know, 10, 20 people here thinking about this question, is uh, about how to uh, send the music to a label, how to get in touch with the label, because it's a question that everybody do here every time, and, and they actually they ask to us. Mm -hmm. They do music here in the different studios, and after they do the music, they come to us and say, hey guys, uh, can we send this to Dennis Ferrer, please? It will happen the next week, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Um, okay, so, so submitting, submitting records. 
Uh, the way I did it was, um, this is very, this is kind of an old school approach to it, so I don't know if this is gonna matter to you guys. Eh? But I picked three labels that I thought made sense to me. Uh, where I thought I could see myself doing shows with them, where I thought, hey, you know, I can be a part of this. One had to be underground. Another one had to be more commercial because somebody's got to push your music, right? It can't all be underground because then you just die in obscurity, right? You make no fucking money and you, you broke, right? So another label that was kind of cool too. So I went with kind of large at that time and I went with defected for the more commerciality of things because at, at the end of the day, you do want to be well compensated for your work, no? That's, that's, that's just the truth of it. We all want to be able to eat from what we, what we love to do. So you got to have some common sense here. Because if all you do is put out deep underground records, you're going to be broke. And to be honest with you, nobody gives a fuck about you. I'm sorry. Nobody does. So you kind of have to, everything is even. So you pick three labels and you say, okay, you know what? This one, this one, and this one. And you throw the dice. Nothing's guaranteed in this life, but at least with these three labels, and if you have a good head and you think about it, you say, okay, I just did this underground record. That sounds similar to something in this, like, in this label's catalog. Because obviously, if they're signing all these records, obviously it's, they have a sound. Well, if you think that record fits into that sound, send it. Now, here goes my theory, and, and people get mad at me for this one. I always believed that when I made a record and I finished it, that record had to be able to be, hang, be able to hang in the top 10 of that genre. If that record I thought couldn't hang out in the top 10, then forget about it. It's not good enough. Why put it out? Why waste your time? What, to be in the 50, to be in 60, to be in the top 70? That doesn't make any fucking sense, does it? No, that's not, that's, not, that's not how you get ahead. You get ahead by trying to be the best you can be, right? So what you do is you say, hey, I'll take this record. I think it fits, I don't know, Circle Local Records, right? Who, what records came out on Circle Local Records? Let's see what the top 10 on Circle Local Records was. Play my record. Does my, that record be Seth? Does that record be this guy? Does that record be this? If my record can whoop everybody's ass on that Circle Local's label, I'm going to Circle Local. Here you go. I almost, can, I can tell you it's going to get signed. It makes sense. I today and yesterday went through your catalog and it is it's clear. It's two, three labels, commercial, underground, and this is a good uh, right. advice. And then the remixes, the remixes are where you get to have fun. Because the remixes let you be you, like really be you. Fuck it. You got nothing to lose. It's a remix, right? So again, but the same theory applies. Hey, this remix has got to be better than the last blah, blah, blah records you've heard. So, so I, that's a New York mentality. And my, mine was always to be better than somebody. Hey, we can be friends tonight. You and I, we can be friends. But if you finish a record and I think it's better than mine, I'm going home and cursing you out. Like, <laughs> no, I'll be on my hard drive. Like, no, 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 trash, 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 trash. But we're friends. But in my era, that's how I had to be. We had to be that way because the competition is very stiff. It's insanely stiff. It's not easy. It's not easy to eat off of this. So you have to have some moxie. You've got, you've got, to, have, you've got to draw the line and say, hey, and judge your work accordingly. But you've got to be humble enough to know, hey, when you suck. And I suck sometimes, yeah, I do. <laughs> Uh, do you have a, the, the studio at home? Or? Yes, I have a studio at home. And uh, what about the process of, uh, we went through the studios mm -hmm. here and you saw, you saw some yeah, inter yeah. interesting pieces. Uh, I have a very crazy studio. <laughs> it's very, very crazy. crazy. Uh, it's, it's, it's insane. Um, I have a lot of vintage gear. Um, Teletronics LA 2A's vintage. Um, I've got 1176 blue stripes that belonged to the studio Grateful Dead used to work in. Um, I've got two Texio 1Bs, 1081s, 
Lexicon 480L reverbs, two AMS RMX 16s. Uh, Maybe none of us we know about this. About is, this is a lot, about of, this. a lot of vintage Even keyboards. Even having some gear here. A lot of vintage keyboards. Um, because I, I come from that era and I like those. You know, they do sound different. People say, oh, it doesn't sound it. No, it, it sounds different. And the mix mastering, last process, you do your own mixes? I, I've been doing this long enough to be able to make my own mixes now. Um, but here's one thing I don't do. I learned the other day. See, you learn something new even when you're old like me. Uh, don't try to master your own records. Don't do it. Don't fucking do it. Don't do it. I, I've, I've, I've done it. And... Uh, we got this record. I did a remix with Seth Troxler just uh, last uh, last month, and uh, I delivered the master. I delivered two masters. One at the Red Book CD standard and minus 0.3, right? Because I'm like, I know how it's going to sound. Don't touch it. But I said, you know what? Just in case, let me bring the level down to minus 6.5 and send a file like that. Now, we, I've used Andreas at Schnitzstelle in Berlin for like the last 10 years. And he's always told me, Dennis, give me something to work with. But because I never trusted nobody, I said, ah, I'm going to send it to Red Book CD Standard. Can I say that? Anyway, so um, I sent him a file at minus 6.5. And what I got back was mind blown. And all I could tell myself is like, you dumb ass. Why did you do this from the beginning? The problem is you can't do it all. We all think we can. And you know what? You can't. It's impossible. Because there's just some things you're good at, some things you're not. It's just a matter of fact. It's interesting to have the theory or having some skills on this area. You, you can. To you, understand. You, you, you could say, okay, you know what? You can get it close, <clears throat> and you, you could print a Red Book CD standard for your own thing to play out. So let's say you want to play out tomorrow night, you want to play out that record, right? You say, okay, well, I'll, I'll print it at minus 0.3. You know, I'll use ozone or whatever you want to use, elephant, whatever you use at the moment. Yeah, print it out. But you're not a mastering engineer. And that's, I think that's the problem. It takes a lot of skill to do what we do. Okay? You've got to, you, you got to become an expert at songwriting. That's hard enough. That's a skill level. Then you've got to become an expert at production techniques. That's another skill. Then what? Another, an, an, another expert at mixing? They used, to pay, they used to pay people just to mix records. That's a skill. That's an art form on its own. Okay? Now you talk about three art forms you're trying to perfect. And now you want to be a mastering engineer? Oh, come on, bro. Like... Really? That, 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 that yeah, but it's, it's happened. it happens always in, in electronic music when I see that uh, the band, for example, the musician, the singer comes and he sings and the technician uh, records the voice and then the other technician uh, mix down the voice and then master the voice and then everything together with different professionals. But in electronic music, there is a, a kind of, I don't know. Because we all, because there's no money in it. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's because of that. It, it's it's Sony is coming and they pay the record. Yeah, record. When, when you get paid $250,000 to do it right, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. You, you can afford that. But we, uh, 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 Phil Damon used to tell me when I was very, very young, he used to say, yo, house music is sneaker money. <laughs> right? And he says, you know why they call it house music? Because all you can do is afford to make it in your house. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> right? That's why they call that's it house studio, music. studio music. <laughs> yeah, that's what. So, yeah, learn the basics, get yourself close. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to, to stay too much at just a part uh, yes. of the, through the uh, nerd uh, experience because there sure. are yeah, 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 some members and uh, there are other people that just came to see you because they are like the, the your music but they don't give a shit about the exactly. studio you know <laughs> but we are studio figures and at the end we went through some story some personal experiences some uh, the techno the te technological stuff from mm -hmm. this so you come today you arrived yesterday i arrived yesterday and i've got to play tonight and then tomorrow uh, off to porto i go okay yep oh. <laughs> 
Yeah, in the taxi we had a very short chat that but is interesting it's interesting to like, it's the the life we live, right? Yeah. But, but this is what, another stuff that no one knows. Yeah, nobody yeah. knows. Uh it's it's not easy to travel in this like travel, but it's been a lot of fun. It's okay. a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Okay, guys, um let's go to a Q&A. Maybe don't uh, don't be shy. Let's start. Ask anything <laughs> you want to know. Teo, he did the uh, <laughs> Teo, he is a member, one of the first member here. He went through many uh, steps and phases from the here. Well, hello Teo. Hey. Hi. I think in this day and age is extremely important. Uh, you make as many friends, as many connections as you can. You learn from everybody you possibly can, and you soak it up like a sponge. Uh, when I was, I had an old school mentality where I kind of stuck to myself. And as I got older, and until recently, I realized that was wrong, because we like to isolate. As a, as, as, a, as a musician, you kind of isolate yourself from the world. You think it's all about you, you, it's me, it's my art, my craft. But it's not. It really isn't. You share it with the world. So you might as well, you might as well share yourself with the world. Make all the friends you can because you never know where these friends lead you. You never know where you're going to see these friends in the future. You just don't know. You should, yeah, enjoy life, bro. For example, the guys from Jackie's. They started to work with us many years ago, and they are very successful promoters. So you have to keep friends all the time. You don't know. Yeah, you know. How, where are Jackie's? Exactly. You're welcome. Más preguntas, chicos, por aquí. Hi. Pleasure to meet you. Okay, so there's a lot of questions. It's, 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 it's a little. <laughs> no, no, no. It's 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 really good actually, but I meant there's a lot of questions for you. Because one, did you do, did you observe? Did you learn anything from playing it for somebody? Did you realize why they didn't move? Did you realize at what point? Did you did you say okay, maybe I came in too late with the vocal? Have you paid attention to when vocals usually start? Like. You, vocals usually start at 120 to 130. Did you realize maybe your vocal was too late? Maybe it was too early? You, when you first play your record out, you pay attention to, this is gonna sound crazy, you pay attention to the girls. It's just the truth. If the girls start walking to the bar, you're in trouble. Right, ladies? As soon as you walk to the bar, it's the truth. The party's over. So you need, that's what DJing is good for. You play the record out, you say, okay, you're paying attention, you're going through the timeline, you're watching the time. When did everybody get bored? Why did they get bored? If you think you're, because remember, I told you, you gotta be humble. Why did everybody walk away at this point in my record? And then you remember, you mark it down. And then you go back to the studio and you fix it. You fix that point. You say, what was missing that everybody walked away at that point? That's what I mean by being humble with yourself, with your art. Because you have to realize there's something wrong. It, the world, it's not you against the world. It's, it's, they don't like my art. No, it's not like that. You fucked up. It's, just, it's the truth. You fucked up. Because if they're not moving at a certain point, then it's your fault, not their fault. So you have to catch yourself, be humble enough to say, okay, the record, everybody's grooving, hands in the air, yeah. This is getting weird, <laughs> right? Has that happened? There you go. <laughs> See, because it's happened to me. You can't lie to me about that one. So, all right, I go back and I go, what happened here? What happened at this point? Was it too boring? Maybe it was missing something. Maybe I took too much out. Maybe it needs an additional thing. 
Maybe I need a new, a new melody on top to raise it up higher. Maybe a vocal bit. Who knows? Records are all different. But at that point, it's you, bro. It is. And you have to learn, you have to teach yourself. Because I said it before, making good records is a learned behavior. But making bad records is also a learned behavior. So if you don't go back and learn how to correct the mistakes in that record, you're just teaching yourself how to make bad records. Understand? So go back, play it for everybody, and see where everybody goes, oh, this is bad. <laughs> and then fix it. And that's the only way you can keep doing it. Because if you try to save the record you're doing right now, yeah, you might get it right, but will you get the next one right? So you gotta teach yourself how to get it right. That's why I said arrangement is very important. That's why we have the bridge lab here. <laughs> <laughs> On Fridays afternoons with some people coming to the after work. So you have to come and play I your mean, records, does bro. Does that help at all? Okay. Las preguntas pueden ser en castellano también, no se corte ninguno. Anybody ninguna. questions, questions, you got me for a couple of more minutes. It's not, sí. Whatever you don't no want to know, don't está ask Dennis me. Por aquí. <laughs> The maximum times I've sent a track to a label, ah, once. You get one chance from me. It's just one chance. Just one chance. If you, if you didn't like one it, if you don't like it, well, it's not for you. Okay. No harm, no foul. No, no yellow card, sorry. I'm good with it. I, I've never, I, I never felt the need to keep giving it, giving it, giving it. I always said, look, either you like me or you don't. I, 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 I admit, I have a very weird style, it's not for everybody. So, yeah, sometimes you get it right, sometimes you get it wrong. We all, it happens to all of us. So, one shot, y ya, largate. Como, sí. ¿ha recibido mi mail? Te he enviado un mail. <laughs> Did you hear the track I sent you? No, that's different. That, that's different, that's different, that's different. Because I get a lot of emails in a day, so, y si me lo enviaste, y ya, no escuché. Oh, that's my fault. <laughs> That's it. Más preguntas. Yes. Yes. Completely. Completely. Um, that's what made me better. Because, like I told the gentleman, um, that's when I was able to see crowd reactions. Crowd reactions are very important when you're making records, especially the, the records we make, dance music. Okay, you need to be able to read the crowd, right? Even when you're playing from DJing from one record to another, right? You're reading the crowd. Well, it's the same way when you make your record. You're reading the crowd, you're watching them, you're saying, okay, here comes this breakdown. Did I do the breakdown correctly? Ah, uh, everybody walked away. You can see the energy gets sucked out of a room when it's wrong. Even when you don't make the record, when it's somebody else's record. When you play the wrong record, right? You go, oh, damn. The wrong record, right? So when you play your own record, it's basically the same idea. Same thing. You're watching everybody, and honestly, like it depends what kind of record. For the most part, there's one kind of record for guys, and it's usually drum records, right? If you make a, if you make a drum record, it's a guy record. We all know this already. And you watch the guys. You go, <laughs> right? And all the girls are like, ah, this is boring, right? And then you have records, what I call, for everybody else, for the normal people of the world. And when you watch that, when women walk off the floor, the party's over. That, that record's done. You have to learn how to fix it. So you, 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 it depends on the kind of record you make. But yes, DJing is completely integral nowadays to, making, to producing records, yes. I believe so. Sí, sí, adel adelante, adelante. Okay, um, you know, it's, it, you know, there's two ways of knowing when your record is really good. This is a really funny one. If any of you have friends who have children, right, bring them by the studio, play the record. Okay, play the record. But don't, don't, don't say you're playing it for them. 
just you're talking to your friend and the children is next next to me. And you're like, yeah, so Johnny, love that. And play the hook. If later on you get a phone call later on that evening from your friend saying, yo, what did you play? My kid's been singing it all night. Then you got to hit. My daughter came into the studio, right, during Hey Hey. She was at that time uh, six years old. She walked in, and I'm like, she said, Daddy, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm working on this record, blah, 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 you know. Hey, I heard you say, hey, 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 whatever. She leaves the studio. She's going to bed at 9 p.m., and I hear, I heard you say, hey, hey, I heard you say, hey, hey. I'm like, who I'm getting paid. <laughs> Oh, I'm getting paid. Honey, we're buying a new house. <laughs> the truth. So that's one way. Have to, when, when it's really, that's how you know. When you can't get it out of your head, when you invite a friend over and your friend sings it in a car ride wherever you're going later and it blah, 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 blah. Or your girlfriend or your wife sings it and she has no idea what you were working on. Or your boyfriend. You've got something. It's there. You've got, you might have to fix a few things, but it's there. Uh, the second way. The second way you know you've got something is when you've done three or four mixes to the same record and the mix you threw away is in the trash and, you, and your friend comes over and says, hey, what are you working on? And you're like, yeah, I was working on this remix, but I threw away the last version because it really sucks. And, and the person goes, well, let me hear it. He's like, man, it's in the trash, bro. I was just about to empty it. He goes, nah, take it out of the trash. You take it out of the trash. And the person goes, holy shit, what is that? And you go, no, 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 please no. That's the mix. Usually the first mix of something you do of a record you think is big, that's the right mix. We always mess it up by doing four different mixes. I can do it better. I can do it better. I can do it better. No, you can't. The original idea, that stupid idea that you had, that went do, 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 that was the better one than the most complicated chord progression you can think of. Okay, uh, we have to finish because, uh, yeah, the, there are some DJs have to play. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, on the queue. So thank you very much for well, coming. Well, thank you guys for having me. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thank you.